our planet is a place full of colour. From reds, oranges, yellows, greens, blues, indigos and violets, we see a rainbow of colours in the world around us. But that's pretty much all we see. And that's because human vision is limited to a narrow spectrum of visible light. Now, either side of that band, you have ultraviolet and infrared light. These are not visible to the human eye, but can be detected using a very simple piece of equipment that even you can use at home. This is a black light. It emits ultraviolet light, which when shined on some everyday objects, causes them to fluoresce in some pretty interesting ways. Should we test it out? Cut the lights. So we have laundry detergent, petroleum jelly, banknotes, tonic water, which looks almost radioactive, and birds. Wait, what? I first heard about birds' hidden patterns early this year when news that puffin bills may fluoresce under UV light caught the internet by storm. More amazing still is that puffins are far from unique. A huge range of birds, including parrots, penguins and owls, also glow under UV light. So, to find out which bird glows the brightest and which bird you should take to a rave, we've come to the Natural History Museum here in Tring, which has one of the world's largest bird collections, home to around 750,000 specimens, which represents 95% of the world's bird species. So I'm here with Alex, head curator of the bird collection here at Tring, and Jamie, ornithologist who brought UV puffins to the world's attention. So Alex, what specimens do we have here? Uh, so we've got a variety of specimens that we can look at today. We've got an Atlantic puffin, of course, crested auklet from the North Pacific, uh, cockatiel, which was collected by John Gould in Australia in the 1840s, uh, of course, the budgerigar, and a northern rockhopper penguin from Tristan da Cunha. And Jamie, your research is all about UV puffins. So how did that research come about? We knew that birds could see to some degree in the UV spectrum. And looking at the bird of an Atlantic puffin, it's really clear that tens of thousands of years of sexual selection have kind of given them this beautiful bill. And yeah, it felt like a good thing to try at the time. So you've looked at alive and dead specimens. Have you had any problems looking at alive puffins? They, they do walk around a little bit. <laughs> so we're not sure what the kind of effect is that shortwave UV light has on the eyes of birds. So it was kind of important that we develop something to protect their eyes just, just to make sure. So we developed these kind of glasses. <laughs> and the idea is that this will kind of bend and will sit over the eyes of the puffin like that. But that doesn't cover the bits that fluoresce on live specimens, which is, which is this bit here which is the cert, and this middle line here, which is the lamella. So I'm pretty keen to get these specimens under the black light. Alex, would you like to pick one first? I, I think we should start with the rockhopper penguin. OK, should we take it under the black light? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. So if we can have the lights off, please, see what we can see. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Okay, so those, those crests really lit up. Why would they be so fluorescent? So they're used in uh, mate choice, so the bigger your crest, the better chance of finding a high quality mate. They occur in both of the sexes, so it's probably part of that sexual signaling. And would you see that in other penguin species? Uh, yeah, so there's six different species of crested penguins, like the northern rockhopper, and they probably all exhibit this trait. So those crests, really important, fluorescence, mate choice, brilliant. Should we get another one under? Let's have a look. Yeah, let's have a look. We've got the crested auklet as well. These guys are related to puffins, so they're the same family. And like the puffins, what the birds are likely to see is this kind of big contrast. So there's very little UV light being reflected off the black plumage. Against the bill, it's just fluorescing. So we've got a specimen here that I think will absolutely knock your socks off. Okay. It's to our eyes. These are cockatiel wings. They're not normally this white, but this one was from captivity. But gonna... we'll see what it looks like okay, under, let's under the have black a look. light. Hmm, I'm intrigued. Okay, let's have a look. Lights out. Oh my goodness me. So because this wing is, is completely white, it lacks the melanin, so it's allowing that yellow pigment to really shine through, which you can see under UV. It looks amazing, so yeah. impressive. 
While these hidden markings might be news to us, they won't come as much of a surprise to other birds. And that's because, unlike us, many birds have adapted to see UV light outside of the human visible spectrum. We have trichromatic vision, meaning we have three different types of cone cells in our retina that can detect blue, green and red wavelengths of light. Now birds have tetrachromatic vision, meaning they have four different cones that can not only detect blue, green and red, but also shorter wavelengths such as UV or violet light. So what does the world look like to a bird? Well, it's still impossible to say, even with these specialist cameras and lighting that can detect these UV signals, we still can't conceive the combination of colours that a bird can see. Take someone who is red-green colourblind, as 8% of men in the UK are. Now you're probably familiar with the Ishihara test, and most of you watching can see the number on this card. But if you put a filter on it which simulates red-green colourblindness, this is what you see. Now, someone who is colourblind has dichromatic vision, meaning that their perception of colour is formed from just two different types of cones. This is often caused by a defect of red and green cones, making these colours appear indistinguishable and making everyday scenes take on an entirely different complexion. Say, for instance, each cone is thought to be able to detect a hundred different gradients of colour, and all colours we perceive are combinations of signals from various cones. Those with dichromatic vision can detect 10,000 different gradients of colour, those with trichromatic vision can detect a million different gradients of colour, and those with tetrachromatic vision, like birds, can detect, theoretically, around 100 million different gradients of colour. So, just as someone with red-green colour blindness can't picture how the world looks like to someone with trichromatic vision, neither can we truly understand how the world looks like to a bird. Should we bring over all three of the parrot species? Maybe start with the budgerigar under the black light. Let's see what they look like. Yeah. So I've heard of this study where it's actually using sunscreen block the fluorescence essentially um, on budgerigars. Uh, what would be the premise of that? So I think that, as, as Alex said earlier, fluorescence is part of a repertoire of, of kind of coloration available to birds, and there had to be a way that we test whether that fluorescence had anything to do with mate choice. So the way to do that is you, you block out that fluorescence altogether with, in this case, with sun cream, and and then see whether the male budgies are still attractive to the female budgies, which it turns out they they were less attractive. So why does elaborate plumage, colours and fluorescence really kind of show sexual prowess? Why is that so important? So I guess that these species have to have some way of showing off to potential mates that they are very kind of good quality and, and, and all things like plumage and colour and, and size shows that you have excessive energy to spend on those things. It kind of shows off that you don't need to spend your energy on, on being healthy because you can afford to invest it on things like fluorescence. Yeah, so you know, taking humans as an example, you might have a nice house, a fancy car, you know, really right. nice looking clothes, you've got that sort of um, expendable income uh, above just sort of typical self-maintenance. And fluorescence is just a part of that. That's just one of the yeah. many tools that birds have at their disposal. So I think you'll agree a few fantastic examples of fluorescence, but this isn't the bigger picture, is it? So, so all we saw today is we're just looking at the byproduct of how UV light uh, interacts with these plumages. Uh, we have no comprehension whatsoever of UV light, or indeed what these birds are seeing when they look at each other. Yeah, so in reality, a puffin doesn't look like a puffin to other puffins. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So from luminous bills to fluorescent feathers, birds are even more amazing than we can see with our own eyes. And we're only just discovering the range of UV displays and the reasons behind them. And while we may never understand what the world looks like through the eyes of a bird, we do know that if you go to a rave, don't forget to pack your parakeet.